I, I was reminded that, um, right before I come here by my graduate student that it, next tomorrow is beginning of uh, spring semester. They told me I shouldn't, I may, I may not want to go because they say they doubt how many of you will be here. So, uh, so for those of you who are here today, you must be dedicated to study. Yeah, I should, I should make that policy ex, extra credited for everyone into the class. Okay. Okay, let's do sign-in sheet. <laughs> well, I'll give you some... I'll start it. I'll, I'll give you some secret code in my here that I will show up in exam you have match. <laughs> okay, so um, the weather is really outside. Uh, it's really nice outside. So, uh, so let, let's move on. So last, uh, um, last week, Monday, uh, I think last Friday, I gave a first lecture of our three system. I didn't quite finish, and I'll finish the rest of that, and, and then I'll move to the second part of our system and finish out today. Um, now, um, this is a, these are the questions that uh, um, I raised in my last lecture um, about our system that we want to discuss. We discuss how is sound converted to neuron firing through the vibration of a hair cell, very important, and and the second. How is the frequency selectivity generated? We talk about that as a vibration, mechanical vibration along the basal memory. That's frequency selective, not here. So that's very important. Third, um, we're going to talk about how is the time represented by neural firing. <coughs> there is a fourth part about speech sound processing, and in the interest of time for, for remaining uh, slides, I'm going to skip this one because uh, I realize that uh, you are you guys are doing right now a speech psychophysics alive. And you just had the two pre lab, and you're going to do after spring break. So that, that lab will teach you quite a bit about speech processing. So I'll skip uh, this part. Now, how is the time represented by neural firing in the system? Why we want to interest in this? And remember the beginning of my lecture last time. And I talked about the auditory system being different from visual system in the sense that in vision, if I show you a hand, there's a picture, I don't have to move it. I define this and turn around the back of my hand. But in audition hearing, when you hear my voice, you hear uh, speech and music, all of the signals vary with the function of time. So time is the essence of the auditory system. So in a way, sound we hear from our ear is like running water on a river. Okay, it's always moving. Okay. Now, you may not have thought about it until now. This is actually quite tricky for the nervous system to represent. Because as the time our sound vary, that time axis physically is the same time axis that action potentials runs in the brain, right? So you have acoustics that go over time from zero or any time we call T1 to infinity. Then you have action potentials that begin with T1 going to infinity. So now you have two time sequence. The action potential is a sequence that's supposed to represent one. So this is this is a situation very different than in visual system where uh, you hear from Dr. Ed Connor, a uh, fine rate of a neuron represent the image. There is no time component there if you think about this, right? So and 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 how is the time represented by the neural firing is a crucial question in audition, and uh, this is also a question uh, exam to uh, example to demonstrate this transformation. That's the point I want to make. Okay. So what I mean is the following. This is slides I showed you earlier that if I present, if we present to a nerve, auto nerve neuron, a sinusoidal that's periodic, and there's action potential that are face locked to this. So we talk about it in last lecture. We talk about what, what's cause of face locking, and you should know that by now. And, and then we'll talk about how do you compute the period histogram that indicate this face locking here. So the point I want to make here is that if you look at neural firing pattern here, this really match the firing pattern here. So there's a structure, time structure, in stimulus that's captured by neural firing. So this is very nice. This is very much like um, I take my hand, this is a ship, I put it on a Xerox machine, push a button, a compact picture that's just mimic like this. This is what does it say? You capture what's in the signal. Okay. This is at the beginning, and we also talk about how do you quantify this in our slides. But but here's a, here's a catch. So here's a summary size of you. What happening to face locking after auto nerve? Okay. One of the things I did not talk about here is that if, if I were to vary this frequency, this frequency now is 768 hertz. If I make it 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 
Do we always see this pattern? The answer is no. This phase locking only valid for low frequency, and that's shown by data here. If we quantify phase locking either by synchronization index or vector strength, that's what's given in this slide. And, and, and as a function part as a frequency of our tone. Remember, this experiment gave a pure tone, ooh, something like that, periodic. We record fire firing rate. We quantify it. Okay? So why is near perfect? There is nothing. So the example we talk about there, 700 some hertz, is somewhere here. Okay? And here, if you go down here, synchronization index is 0.8. It's pretty good, right? And it's almost perfect when you're about 100, 200 hertz. Now, as the frequency of tone becomes higher and higher, the phase set can become worse and worse, eventually disappear. Okay, it's also never data, ever data. So what it means intuitively is that if I give you a time varying signal, play a sound, and, and if you look behind your ear, out your nerve, firing, when you think it goes slow, never can follow it. You know, you go up and down, nerve follow up and down. But if you make it really, really fast, at some point, the nerve cannot follow. So that means above this frequency, this is about four kilohertz. There's absolutely no phase locking. We'll get that point later on. Phase locking only exists in low frequency defined by this curve. That's a very important thing for what we learn about hearing. Secondly, is that this nerve is where that is. This is here. This is a calculator we discussed last time. This auto nerve. Then from there on, signals, action potentials travel through the next stage called calcium nuclei, inferior colicus, thalamus, and auto cortex. You just heard lectures by Dr. Ed Connor earlier uh, this week. And what is equivalent to auto nerve is what? Optical nerve. Okay. Just remember where does optical nerve go? From here, we're, you know, visual system, what's the next station? Anyone remember? Dr. Connor must discuss this, right? So you have a retina that is equivalent to cochlear. Then the outer layer, output layer of a retina is called ganglia neurons. It's connected by optical nerve, that equivalent to auditory nerve. And that optical nerve goes somewhere. Where is that? You guys remember? Dr. Connor discusses, right? Someone say the RGN, right? Lytogenic nuclei, that's a thalamus. What is equivalent to RGN in here? It's here. So this is thalamus here, I didn't specify. The auditory part of the thalamus, the thalamus is multisensory. There's an auditory part called MGN, video genetic. Visual part called LGN. Then there's some sensory part called VPO, okay? So that is here. So that means that in the visual system, from here, you basically draw a line right into here. Okay, that's very important to know as a comparison. But you see, in auditory system, the signal goes from here, here, actually, here, here, then several stage. So why you want to do this? Okay, this actually has a consequence functionally, and it actually reflects the needs of a signal processing in audition being different from vision. Okay, so if we take our simple example of a face lock into tone and follow that through each stage. Here's what happened. So if we repeat the experiment here, but record from cochlear nuclei, same tone phase locking analysis experiment that you could do now, then this is curve, the curve is here, okay? So the curve shift to left means what? Means the neuron's ability to phase lock decrease. Decrease, it can only phase lock no more than two kilohertz. Here's four kilohertz. If you continue this record, go to the next stage called inferior colicus. The curve is here, thalamus here. By the time you reach cortex, face locking is here. Okay, what is this? This is about 100 hertz. That means that if I give a neuron firing to tone in cortex, I give you real data, you will find out above 100 hertz, there's no face locking. Okay, that's actually, think about this. This is what it means that we just said earlier, face locking reflects the auditory system's ability to follow time varying signals. And we say the time varying signal is crucial, right? Now, if I give you a CD that has music, do you know what is a sampling rate in CD? Anyone knows? Sampling, sampling rate in CD. Anyone knows? This is in the signal processing, because I mean, if, what's the sampling rate in the standard commercial CD? That it, well, you don't use CD now, you use MPEG 3, 4, and all of them involve sampling rate. All right. What is sampling rate in CD? 44.05 kilohertz, right? Because that's twice, roughly twice as the highest frequency we hear. 
the algorithm I showed you last time, human care about 20 some K. Okay, it's something twice the likest sampling rate. You, you remember single process. Okay, so why we sample this high? Because the sound carry changes very fast. Okay, that, that we have to capture. If you're an engineer and ask to do the digitizer, that's, that's the rule you go by. Okay, but here I'm going to tell you that your brain and my brain, and in fact all the animals brain, we know mammals, in cortex, face locking is no higher than 100 hertz, rough speaking, that is, it's a sample just in that range. But anything goes faster than 100 hertz, it cannot follow. Okay. This is actually computation, a big problem. Problem that being that if I give you a CD, I say you filter out any component higher than 100 hertz. I only leave 100 hertz and slower because that's the only thing cortex can follow. And you listen to a signal, what is that signal like? Garbage. There is nothing. If you figure out all the high frequency in the gun. So this actually puzzled the scientists in this field for 30, 40 years. People don't figure out going on because everyone expects face locking like this. Right? This capture what we hear because our speech, our speech what you hear every day is from 500 hertz to 2K is here. Okay. Of course, music, other things are here. Okay. And for a long time, people didn't care about music in the brain. They care about speech. People care about music more now. Okay. So this actually poses a computational problem for auto system that how to deal with time variant signal that goes really fast. Okay. Now, here's the experiment we did it to solve this, right? So, so what I indicate here from fast to slow means the higher face locking is, the greater the ability a neuron can follow time variant signals. But with this, the question is, how could an cortical response account for the perception? Okay. Now, you guys should be familiar with this, right? So this is an experiment I got you to do. I believe that's my first exam, first homework exam. Uh, you generate a collect trend and with a varying intercollect interval, and then you listen to that, and you decide whether you're here is discrete or continuous, right? Is that for first homework I gave? Okay. And I haven't looked at the data from, uh, from TS. So what is the boundary value? Let me get a couple of samples. So what is boundary value where your, perce your perception in your hand change from discrete to continuous? What's your value? Frequency or interval? Where is that? What's your? Just remember from homework, um, roughly. I don't remember, actually. You don't remember? OK, so do you remember? Yeah, it was in the middle. <laughs> in the middle, what was the middle? What is the, 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 anyone give a number? Anyone give me a number you remember? In terms of, did I ask you hertz or millisecond? Millisecond. Millisecond, okay, let's say millisecond, because I change that from time to time. Because okay. whenever you look at my homework, if you think this is identical to a year before, you'd be really careful. There are things that change, I don't tell everyone. Okay, <laughs> this is my joke one year. I trust all of you, but I still, from year to year, I make changes. So this is, this is a joke I just told you. There's a real thing. Years ago, I gave one homework one year. I thought it was so good. I want to repeat it. Because making a homework actually is a lot of work, I tell you. Making a nice, interesting homework, a lot of work. So I decided I gave homework to next year. Same thing. But I thought, you know, I want to just say, if everyone is honest enough to do it. So without telling anyone, including my TA, which was my graduate student sitting next to my office, I changed the formula sign from plus to minus. So the end results in the year before should go up. After I change that, it should go down. I didn't tell anyone. I gave homework and told my, uh, told my uh, TA, I said, if you see any homework the curve goes this direction, call me. Sure enough, there are a few of them. The coming goes the same direction as the previous year. That means either student didn't pay attention or simply they thought it was the same homework they went to last year, copy it. No one knows that actually that direction is the opposite. Okay. Just tell you, never always do homework on your own. Okay, but <laughs> let me let me come. This is a real story. I didn't make it up. Um, now, the homework I gave you there. Uh, let me get a couple more samples. <coughs> What's the how many milliseconds your transition point is? Any? Do you remember? Yeah. Do you remember? 20, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds. Anyone remember? What? You had, you had a range. The range I gave it to you is somewhere between 100 milliseconds on, from 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. Is this range? I think it was around like 40, 45. 40, 40, 45 milliseconds. Anyone? Remember? Man, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> I thought you could remember. But let me tell you this. It's somewhere here. Okay? Your perception changes from discrete to continuous. So remember, this collect trend you generate, acoustic is all discrete, physical is all discrete. 
right? One by one, there's not a condition. But, you, but when you hear this, when it becomes fast enough, you hear them continuous. Do you understand? Do you wonder why? Here's the answer. Okay. So this is an experiment we did in, 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 in the animal where we call from neuron in the outer cortex. We play exactly the same click train that gave you to do homework. So when play click train, when this repetition is slow or intervals long, and uh, here's the interval, ICI, here's uh, neuron firing, those are dot rasters. There are 10 trials, so they're lining up like a line, but there are 10 dots here. You see, the neuron can follow 10, 100 millisecond interval, 75, 60, 40, blah, blah, blah. You know, it can follow, follow, follow until about this range. You see, it becomes messy, it doesn't follow. And, and below here, 20, 30 milliseconds, there's nothing at all. Okay, how long is stimulus? This is a one second long. I think the same thing. This is almost identical stimulus used. Okay, so that means in the range where you hear click or continue or discrete, your brain responds like this. So this is roughly the boundary. Almost more all of you, for example, all of you, 100 of you, are Gaussian distribution, right here, all of you is here, okay? So the question here, then, when you play them with faster and faster speed, you hear them all the way through, right? You hear every click you play to yourself, okay? But then, what happened to this range? For a long time, nobody knows what happened, because it's big a hole, because it's making no sense, because you hear it, animal here, your brain must be responding. And then, uh, one, one of the graduate students in my life did, oh, shoot, it's frozen again. Oh, oh shoot, shoot. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. This one did it twice. It must be, okay, I think my computer frozen again. That's, oh, okay. Let me, let me restart. This is a, could be a recording program that's, Okay, let me, let me uh, shut down and restart and let me tell you what's going on while we're going here. Um. I think there's a recording problem. So anyway, so, so what I'm going to tell you, the other half of the slides in a few minutes you will see is that it, uh, the neuron I just show you represent about 50% neuron in cortex, in outer cortex, where you give a repetition rate when it's slow, it follow. When it's really fast, where you began to hear is continuous, it did not follow. Okay. Then the other half of the slide shows, and then we discover, actually it's discovered by, by the former graduate student in my lab, who was actually one of you, he was an undergraduate student here in this program, sitting here about 15, about 20 years ago. Okay, he was an undergraduate here and stay on the PhD student. And in his doctoral thesis, he discovered the other half of neuron in outer cortex, which he did something completely opposite. They did not fire when things go slow. Okay, but they began to fire when things go fast. They fire more when things go really fast. Okay. And that study showed that in our brain, basically, let me give you some uh, summary of what it, we believe is going on here. Is this how, the, how we process it? I'll just run through this and messages, and we'll look at data. If I give you this signal, you listen your psychophysics homework, that give you the first one, from, from an interval SI from 100 milliseconds to 50, 30, 10, Maybe go higher, right? It's more slow to fast. I say, use, g give you a computer and capture this. What do we do? You will find it's a faster signal, a calculate and increase the sampling rate, and make sure computer capture a fast one, and then capture everything else. That's what you do, okay? But what brain does is, is not the hair. What, what the outer cortex does is, for the slow one, it capture every pulses. For the fast one, it integrate, convert into firing rate. Now, why you want to do this? The reason is the following. It's a one, there are two reasons. One is a biological, one is a competition. Biologically, to design a neural circuit that can sample as fast as a computer is not feasible. Most neurons are very nosy. Neuron sampling rate is no higher than 100 hertz. If you want to sample, design neuron circuits with, with all synapses, iron channels, everything you know, to sample a kilohertz or greater, cannot be done. That, that is biological. So, but, but why we still wanted to process sound that goes fast? Because 
sound that we say music is speech, the fast component defining our speech music, your, your quality of sound. If you remove that, you hear just boring. Okay, that's an audition. But in vision, if you remember, Dr. Um, Ed Conner told you about in vision, signal goes very slow, right? Uh, when, when we say you see a movie things are long, what, what is the frame rate of a movie? 60. Uh, yeah, 60. Well, it's in actually almost half of that. Frame rate of a movie is about 24, 25. Basically, when you individual domain, if you change the signal at a rate of 24 frames per second, you consider it completely continuous anymore, right? And it turned out that rate, that boundary is the same as what you uh, are hearing, okay? So in visual system, brain is very slow very slow. In outer system, here is very fast. But at the end in the brain, they have to merge together because when you go see the movie, right, uh, when, when a foreign movie, the, the, someone else spoke, uh, make a sound, you always match the leap. You look at some of the leap movement, you move the sound because the visual outer system combined. So when you have two systems, outer system is very fast, visual system is very slow, at the end they want to con connect them. This is just like you have two computer network with the slow is fast. How do you sync them? Well, you cannot make a slower system faster. You can only make a faster system slower. This is exactly what the brain does. Brain bring down the auditory system to the speed of visual system so they can talk. This is the basic message and, and I was gonna give you here. And another way to think about it is, 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 is the following, is, 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 is processing, okay, from a second processing view. So if I give you a second amount of sound, I say, check its quality frequency, okay. When you do FFT of a piece of sound, you all should know from signal processing that FFT, you require the window and length, right? If you just take a one point, you cannot do Fourier transform. You need to take a certain length of a signal to do to do the form, transform. Uh, let me close this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just skip the uh, recording part. I think that's what make um, um, my computer crash. So look, I'm going to skip my recording. The move on. So I, th I think I'm back. Sorry about it. So uh, next time, oops. Okay. So next time, I, I'll, 
I, I will put into a computer. I thought the last time was a single image. So anyway, so, so, so these are the neur neurons that it, we call it synchronize it. It just go along with stimulus to really capture. Okay. And this is a neuron that's really interesting, surprising, that it, um, it's different neuron called lung synchronize. That is the same stimuli. When the repetition rate is slow, you see there's not much going on. When, when interval becomes shorter or speed becomes faster, neuron becomes far, far, faster, faster. You can quantify this by calculating fan rate. We talk about plot here as interval. You can see when the interval becomes slower, this is, goes up. Okay. Why this wasn't discovered until this, this year, this is about, almost about 15 years ago, that's because of the previous 30, 40 years, people did experiment in anesthetized animals. When animals anesthetized, for some reason, these neurons become silent. People didn't know this. All people saw is this, and the people cannot understand why, what's going on here. And then we developed a technique where, uh, in a chronicle condition with a miniature electrode, uh, we can record of neurons in that condition. There, uh, we discovered this. So this is this is really work by student Tom Lu, who was uh, uh, I mentioned as a BME undergraduate here. Actually, he was he took this class before I taught it. Uh, I started teaching ninety five uh, before he become my questions. Anyway, so what does that mean? And let me put it together. So computationally, this is what it, oh. What is, where does it start again? Uh, look, can I, can I use, sorry, can I use it for Why? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no it's, it's a back thing. I think it's just a slow. Um, so, so what does it mean the following? So if you take those two type of neurons, we quantify this. This is a model that come out. So if you quantify face locking in the neurons that can synchronize the vector strength, and you can see vector strength drop this as the speed becomes faster and faster. Okay? And the other neurons, the neurons like this type, the firing rate increase as the interval changes. The neuron goes like this. Okay? These two populations together basically can account for a signal that's slow to fast. Where the two intersect around here is the, the perceptual boundary of discreteness. That's exactly the homework I gave you to do. So your number would come, most people were around here. Okay, we're around here. This is also voice uh, onset time of speech. The, another homework I just gave it to you a week ago ask you to talk about VOT. VOT boundary is the world so somewhere here. So, so what this tells us is actually our perception of a continuous signal or discrete signal very much depends on how the neuron in our cortex to, uh, to, uh, to operate, to process it. Okay. And uh, so that, that, that is the notion that, that we want to talk about how the time presented. So let me summarize in one more sentence. That is, in our cortex, fast signals at the level of cortex as you move through the signal. Slower signal is captured by face locking, but face locking limit becomes lower and lower as you move up. At the same time, the fast signal is converted into a fine rate representation. Okay. The general no importance of these two representations is the following. This is what we call an isomorphic or faithful representation in the sense that if you look at this signal pattern, you know what's the stimulus. This is exactly processing. I put my hand in the Xerox machine, push button has come out exactly. Okay. Whereas this representation is non-isomorphic in the sense it is transformed. If you, if you just look here, you could not tell this repetition with is this. But when you vary repetition rate, finally changes. So the information here, you can decode here. Okay. The analogy of that in vision is that in retina, if I give you a hand, if you look at a picture in retina, it's just like my five fingers. But I know you remember my hand. Somewhere in your higher visual cortex, my hand is recorded. But don't expect to go to a visual cortex, open the brain, you see my hand lay down there. Okay, my hand is not laid down like this. This hand, front of my hand is remembered by neurons in your higher visual system, by class of neurons. But if I turn back, there's another picture of my hand in my back hand, there is another representation. Those two representations do not look exactly uh, front, back of my hand. That is the analogy of this transforming mention. So that means there are parts of a signal is directly copied by neurons. There are other signals are transformed by neurons. This is one of the most important principles in central nervous system processing. We'll come back again and again uh, to highlight it. This is one of the examples. 
Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, given time and uh, uh, limit, so I'm going to skip the uh, part of the speech and go to um, next one. And uh, and I hope you get your speech um, knowledge from the um, from the lab. Okay, so uh, the remaining time, I'm going to go through about two points that I think is very important to audition. One of them is the signal, uh, how signal goes through system. So, so quickly, here's the layout of the his system. But don't worry about all the terminology. I'm not going to ask you to memorize, but you should know conceptually how signal flow. So this is a calculator. So here, so you got to go through all this stage. Okay. One of the things to point out here is that we have two years. So in order to system, signal are crossed very early. So if this is the left ear, this will be right ear, this middle line. Okay. Signal coming here in the first stage after cocker nuclei, cross middle line, go our side. There will be a mirror mirror picture I did not plot here. So basically from here above, every structure receives signal from two years. Okay, from two years. But why we need a two year signal? Okay. And and as the principle I mentioned to you earlier, I summarized here. What can central nervous system do? do okay? What can central nervous system do? Central nervous system neurons can extract or compute the stimulus information not explicitly encoded by sensory receptors. The receptor means the hair cell, a retina uh, in the visual system. Second, the central nervous system transforms isomorphic physical representation of a sensory stimuli established in the peripheral uh, periphery to non isomorphic representation. So what it means is that at the fingertip, at a, at a, at a, in, a, in a retina, in a cochlear, representation of external physical stimulus is very faithful. It has to be that way, because that's how it's going to get into the system. But as one moves into a central nervous system, in any central system, there is a transformation that takes place. So we're going to use a couple of exam, uh, examples to talk about that. And this is one question, one concept that you must understand, because it will be in your homework, it will be in your exam again and again. Because it's one of the most important to understand how the brain process signal sensory stimuli. Brain process sensory stimuli not in a way as a copy machine but transform this. So we're going to highlight that transformation. This fast and slow repetition I talk about is one example. Now I'm going to give you another example of this transformation, that how this central nervous system neurons can compute this information not exist in the receptor. Okay. And this is the slides that we went through last time. This tonal type of organization frequency, for example, this information was not created by central nervous system. That's created by peripheral nervous system. But central nervous system, take it. Which information is created by central nervous system? We can look at what's hanging on in here. That is right after the, the cock nuclei. There's a structure here in the brainstem called medial superior olive or lateral superior olive. Okay, don't, worry, don't worry about the acronyms. We'll, we'll talk about it. So the point here is that these neurons take signal from left ear and the right ear. Okay, left ear and the right ear. Okay. Now what they do? We we'll use that example to illustrate this notion of computation. So this is the explanation of these two structures. Okay. So the explanation we want to give you is following. Let's jump on this slide. That is sound localization. Okay, this is one of the most important of audition. So if I sit, if I stand on here, if I turn off all the lights so that you cannot see me, I continue to talk. And, and those of you who are on this side knows I'm to your right. Here knows I'm to your left. Right in the middle, you know I'm in front of you instead of on the back of you. Okay. This ability you do with your other system in the absence of vision is called a sound localization. Okay. Sound localization, we use the three cues. Okay. We use three cues. So for example, if this is somebody's head, it's nose, left ear, right ear. A sound comes from off the middle line. Because of physics, it will arrive your left ear earlier than right ear. Arrive left earlier than right ear because the sound will pass. Your head has a certain size. So that creates two prime information piece. One of them is there's an inter-oral time difference. Okay? The ear that gets sound earlier has a shorter delay than here. There's a delta T here. And also, the longer it takes for sound to travel, the more greater degradation, the reduction of amplitude. So between two years, there's an inter-oral sound level difference, intensity difference. 
Okay, those two pieces of inf information allow you to tell sound from left and right. In a moment, we'll explain why you have two. Because physically, um, as you can tell here, one of them is enough to tell this information, right? There's a reason from the system point of view. There's a third cue we're not going to talk about here, is I say that if you write in front of a me, middle line, where delta t or delta o are both zero, okay, you know a middle. But in the middle, you tell people, you close your eye or turn off all the light. It's from front, top, back, or down. Okay. That is done by this, by our external ear. Our external ear serves as a filter. That cue allows us to tell this direction. Okay. That direction. Now let's talk about how the auditory system processes this, and this information. Now remember, if uh, I give you information from one ear, here, you all know cochlear here, you know outer nerve here. If you look, look, just look at outer nerve firing here, can you tell which direction sound comes from? If I allow you just listen one ear, can you? No. So localization, this is an example, beautiful example showing what a central nervous system can do. Because localization information does not exist in one ear in the peripheral. It has to be combined and computed. Okay. Now how does it bring computed? Um, here's how the brain computer. This is an example I told you uh, along the middle line, your ear serve as a filter, and then the external ear generates different notches. That varies when you go up and down. Okay. So, so here's the situation. How, how's the nerve generated here? Do this calculation. Okay. Suppose we uh, look at the nerve. This, this is the nerve neurons in a structure called MSO, medial superior artery. Okay. And uh, uh, now there are two ears. This, in, this in neurons receive inputs from left ear, outer nerve coming in from right ear. Okay. So when you have a sound here, for example, there's a speaker here to the left. It arrives here first, and arrives here second. Now here's what happened. And everything I'm talking about here, you already know already. That is, the, here come here, vibrate here so, and the channel open, and the action potential generate. And this outer nerve action potential runs through here. Okay? And then moments later, sound arrives here, same thing happened, action potential runs through here. Now what's interesting here is that, is that these neurons, neurons in MSO, has a very unique property in a sense their temporal integration window is very short. Remember the concept of temporal integration in the lab you guys did with me a couple weeks ago? That when two signals come in succession, it has to become close enough to make neuron fire. How close? That's dependent on temporal integration window. If a window is short, two, spike, two events have to be very close to trigger one. If window is long, they can be far apart. Okay? That, that's the reason I introduced that concept in another life. Now, MSO neuron has a very, very short temporal integration window to the point that they need two action potential from both ends arrive nearly simultaneously for this neuron to fire, called a coincident detection. Okay. Given that property, then which of the neuron would fire when sound comes from here? Because the sound comes here first, comes here second. In order to, for the action potential generated by this left ear to meet with the right ear, this has to, this has to travel longer distance, so they compensate for the longer path here. So for this neuron, we label it E here, it would fire when there's a sound source from here because it just match from both here. Okay? Then if we say we make a sound from the right side, go here first, go here second, then this neuron with all the path would fire. Okay? That called coincident detection. Therefore, by this you can imagine this neuron A, B, C, D, E would encode the location A, B, C, D, E around space. Now here's a question. In order to for this to happen, in order for it to happen, that is for action potential from two years to reach here nearly simultaneously to trigger neuron fire. What kind of property of action potential trend on here you would expect? We we'll talk about the action potential trend can have all kinds of property. Can be random, can be face locking, can be anything you can quantify. I give you all the tools. Okay. If if the action potential come here with or without face locking, does that matter? Does it matter or not matter? Why, why does it matter? Because then the, I don't know if this is right, but then the signals wouldn't constructively interfere with each other. Like they wouldn't build up 
Yeah? Suppose if, if acupuncture come here, has no physiologic, all right? It's, if we no physiologic, we, we, we talk about it in a couple of lectures ago. We say we model as a Poisson process. Let's say, for simplicity, acupuncture is a Poisson process coming here. Here's another Poisson process. Then what is the probability that within a very short time window that you have two action potential, one from each side, big or small? Very, very small, yeah. Very small, small. So essentially, you can do mathematics, you find out that if there's no face locking, the chance of this neuron fire is near, next to zero, okay? So in order for neuron fire, and fire again, 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 you need face locking from here. So when two Action potential, both are face locking, there's a periodic. So we can meet again, again, again. So now, with that in mind, then now can you tell what, are the, what kind of a sound this neuron can process? Can neuron process any sound for that purpose? No, because we said earlier, face locking has a limit. On a low frequency, face locking you can process. High frequency, you can process. So this, now I, I connect all of them together now. Right. So now these circuits for the process interoral time difference can only deal low frequency where phase locking exists. So this is one use of phase locking. But then what about high frequency? Because if I give you high frequency, you can still tell left and right, right? It turns out that was done. Let me jump, jump through here. Uh, I'll let you read here. It's done by these circuits. Okay. There's a circuit here. It's called LSO, just next to that. It also receives signal from left ear and the right ear, except the signal from right ear goes through internal neuron, become inhibitory. So MSO neuron both and come excitatory. Here is excitatory inhibitory. Okay, this is one thing. Second is, is that uh, the temporal integration window of this neuron, uh, in contrast to MSO, which we just said earlier, is very, very short. This is long. Okay, this is long. So it's, it does not require action potential to come here at the same time and the integrate lumbar vacuum potential to give a rise the response. Okay? Now, they, they, they also show that this the action potential that arrive here, which you can, if there's no physiologic, how you quantify that? How you quantify spike trend if there's no physiologic? What, what measure you use? Firing rate. Right. If there's no phase locking, you don't bother to calculate synchronization, all of it. Just firing rate. So it turns out that the firing rate difference between left ear and right ear decide this neuron is firing. So this neuron is essentially plus here, minus here. If this is louder, you have this high firing rate. This is weaker, you have firing rate. The net difference until sound comes from left and vice versa. Okay. So therefore, this structure allow you to do the computation uh, through a high frequency. So I said a couple minutes ago, when we have an interoral time and frequency difference, now this and other things together tell us that the auditory system use time interoral time difference to tell some from left and right for low frequency. And high frequency use interoral intensity difference. That is the two mechanisms we use. And the first one requires uh, phase locking. Okay. Let me go back to finish here. Okay. So now this model, it turns out, since you are taking this as an uh, upper level class student, now I'll tell you, this is in a textbook. Any textbook you open, that tell a story. Now I have to tell you, it's not quite true like this. Okay. It turns out, this beautiful coincidence detector only true in birds. So in birds, they find this, okay? Beautifully, now two aside, and in fact, the anatomic you tell here, MSO, left and right, you require action potential. Because to do this coincidence detector, you need the length really match. And the people never find this in mammals. Never find it in mammals. They assume in us, we don't have. But, but we, people still know that psychophysically, we use the interval time difference to tell left and right. That is correct. Okay. So what happened in the last about 10, 15 years, people discover in mammals another, so this, this doesn't exist in mammals. People discuss this, this is it, so in mammals. And in mammals, the neuron in MSO receive excitatory inputs from one ear, one side, and the other ear. If selectable means the same side, control means the other side. But at the same time, they also receive inhibition. So now you have excitation coming, inhibition coming, 
the balance of this create the time difference. Okay, so the long story short, I'm tell you this now. So, so the most recent notion, this will become a textbook in a few years. A few years, we'll no longer talk, talk about the earlier one. Is that is the, the balance of excitation inhibition compute into a time difference for mammals. Okay. And, uh, the, and I will suggest you read through here and in your time. So uh, I'm going to le let you to read it here. Okay. The last, uh, I have about five minutes, uh, five or six minutes. I, I, I promise to let you go before the hour ends. Um, let me tell you one more thing that's, that's, that's really interesting and, 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 and I touched upon earlier. That is how we process the processing in speech called pitch. As I told you earlier, there's a pitch here that in English when you say, are you sure, uh, indicate that you are skeptical, right? And uh, here's my favorite example. And uh, uh, in Chinese, which is my native language, there's four tones. I just want to try to see how many you can get it. So if you say my, pronounce my name, my name is Wang, W-N-G, right? So there's a whole four ways. I don't, did I practice it to you guys idea? Yeah. Okay, forget it, never mind. You already get it, sorry. So my, I'm getting over to now. So you got, you got my point. But the question is, where, what I will tell you here is, that where is that processed? Okay. We actually know that now. That is also done by graduate student here, right in this, uh, this department. So where pitch come from? When you say pitch, when you say ah, uh, or ooh, or when pitch is from here, it's right here, okay. I mean, you can fix this. If you, you can tweak certain, you, oh, no, 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 no. you can work. Right. You can make a hundred down, you know. Right. So that's a pitch. That's another Chinese example I gave it to you in English as well. So where this thing come from, this thing is a process in here. I just going on to be short. It's about 10 years ago, and uh, uh, we did a study where we identify a center of a pitch right in the low frequency of outer cortex. And uh, this is a, a, a experiment that show data. Let me show you a comparison. So in, uh, we did this experiment in animal called marmoset monkeys. And this is a pitch center where they take a pitch. And in the same time, there are four or five groups people now find in humans. There's also a pitch center near the same area here. So we now know in both humans and monkeys, that's all we know, we don't know anything below monkeys. Human and monkeys, they have brain regions we call the pitch center. And just a couple of weeks ago, we did another study. We showed the marmoset monkeys perceive pitch like humans. So when we did this over 10 years ago, we say there's a region for pitch. And other people say there's a region for pitch in humans. Because the monkey brain and human brain are similar in structure, so we can say these two are linked. But the people know in humans we perceive pitch very, very finely. But 10 years ago when we did this work, nobody, we didn't know whether mom said hear pitch. People say, how do you know animal hear pitch, right? How do you know animal knows the one, 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 right? How do you know animal knows? So it took many years, just a couple of weeks ago, we published a work, um, some of you may, may read, it's all over the place. Scientific American called me, made an interview, all over, the, all over the place. Basically we show this monkey hear pitch in the same way human hear. Why that's, that's important? Because here it gets to the question that I raised from the very beginning of my lecture when we talk about audition. That one of the things that are very important for auditory system is that we, we, we listen to music. Okay, you guys must, must have heard the story in the last couple of days all over the globe. The AlphaGo beats, AlphaGo beats human in, in the chess game, right? Everyone says, oh, you know, humans are gone, the machines come. So I told my colleague, you should ask that machine one question. Do you listen to music? And we're not. Okay. The point is that, uh, that uh, music is actually one thing that links to a lot of us as a human being. You ever thought about why you use music? And music has a pitch in that. Okay. And people argue for a long time where our ability to process music comes from. So in human brain, we know where there's a pitch center. And most people agree this has everything to do with music. Right? But where does this come from? Okay. Now, we identify a pitch center in the monkey. This monkey separated with human 40 million years ago. This is a monkey living in South America. 40 million years ago, South American continent detached from Europe and Asian continent. So monkeys are continue to grow, evolve eventually into human. That's the evolutionary tree. Whereas the monkey stayed back then in South America, continue to grow, but never evolved into human. Okay. In South America, there was no bamboo, no lara monkey. You know, when to some point, it stopped. Okay. So the fact that we identify pitch in this monkey 
And this monkey showed similar patients perceiving in humans, indicated our ability to process patients in human brain may originate way back then or even earlier. Okay. So that argument to many musicians or people studying musicology or for neuroscientists, our ability to process music or our preference to want to listen to music depends on their brain structure biologically imprinted here long ago until we are become a modern humans. Okay? So the very last question I want to tell you is also one that relates to your everyday life. That is, um, why do our voice sound different on the tape? Have you ever heard your um, voice on the tape? Okay, what do you feel? <laughs> Terrible. So I have, a I have a confess to you. Every year we record my video, right? My video is recorded every year. Once in a while, I will say, oh, let me go, go online and see how, 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 how my sound. I, I just, I never finish one lecture. I never. I look at this and say, just terrible, just sort of terrible. So do you ever wonder why our voice sounds to ourselves in your head? So nice, so beautiful, so wrong. <laughs> Where everything is totally different? Okay. This is a really interesting scientific question. I ask a question all around. When I go lectures anywhere in the world, people give me some questions. Okay. So, so, here's, so here's the thing. So let me just jump through. You can read this through here. So, so, so here's, the, here's the one experiment that, that is sort of tell you, tell you what's going on here. That is, uh, that is uh, if I do the following experiment, okay? If I give you a headphone, give you a microphone, and then you can listen to yourself through a headphone, then I say, well, say, ah. Then I secretly shift the frequency, then you hear, ah. You say, ah. Uh, but you hear yourself by shifting, ah. What are you going to do? Or you're going to compensate, say, oh, I sound too high. Then you're going to produce, ah. Okay. So this experiment told us that basically every day when you speak, when I speak now, when you speak, you hear yourself and you constantly change that feedback. So when you are tired, you sound sluggish. You know it. When you go to a job interview, you're sitting there very nervous. You hear yourself trembling, then you calm yourself down. So we hear ourselves feedback all the time. Most of the time we don't pay attention. But which part of the brain that control that? Okay, control that. So there's one experiment that people, uh, we did long ago. Actually by a graduate student who is a professor now. This is Steve Ellis. He's one of BME students, one of you, about 20 years ago. And he finished bachelor here, degree here and moved on, did a PhD, MD PhD in Hopkins, did a research in my lab. He's a professor in UPenn now. So we did a study. We have electrodes in the monkey brain, in the outer cortex. And, and of course, we play sound, the response. But suddenly, the animal vocalizes. This is Marmor said, right? If you ever wonder, you come to my life, you listen. Marmor said, woo! And you see, there's no spike. This is strange, right? I told you, outer system is supposed to respond to sound. Well, this means that when, when, when monkey talk, there's no response. So that means that when I talk, part of my brain doesn't respond. Okay? This is, at the time, it was very odd. So anyway, so we, we went on, we identified, find out this is the average firing rate in outer cortex when marmoset and monkey talk. Zero is the time monkey actually talk. Okay? So this is the baseline. You can see about 200 milliseconds before monkey talk, outer cortex is suppressed. Continue surprise until it's come back. This actually has been shown in humans as well. If you record from a human brain with a surface electrode, if you ask people to listen to the word and ask people to immediately repeat the word, response is always lower when you repeat than listen. This makes absolutely no sense because both sounds suppose are same loudly, so right? you should be the same. Okay? So what happens? is next that then we did the experiment we thought well maybe this has something to do with this feedback monitoring i just gave you that we listen to ourselves all the time okay so we did an experiment in, in mama said we give mama said the headphone we get a microphone we have digital signal processing because you know uh, he's still just like you as bme students knows the computer knows the programming blah 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 so we set up a system so what we did is, uh, we have electrodes in the monkey brain, we record from the neurons. The monkey vocalizes, woo! We shift the frequency, make it higher. Okay, this is what happened. When, when monkey hears its voice normally without any change, it's suppressed. When we shift the frequency by quarter of octave, not much, but enough to outside range, suddenly neuron become firing. So this experiment proved that there are neurons in outer cortex sitting there detecting a match 
between what is produced, what is supposed to produce. There's error, the fire. Okay. And here's a, a summary of this, of what, what I talked about so far here. So if this is your year, this is brain stem, this is your cortex. We spend a lot of time talking about sound coming from here into here. Okay? When we hear some sound, this is, circuit is active. Then when you decide to see something, produce the word, your motor system produces the word, and through your larynx, you produce sound here. Okay? But internally, which you will hear from Dr. Shanamir, this is something we call forward model. It had a copy of the signals. Okay? But when you just listen to sound, this system is not working. You hear here. But when you vocalize some sound, the motor signal sends the copy to module here. That's why the response is suppressed. The reason to do this is that this internal copy has to be compared with this general error, a comeback. This is a very process you learn foreign language. I don't know how many of you have learned foreign language. When you learn foreign language, for example, you learn Friday. The first time you hear, if you never speak English, the first time you hear Friday from a video is perfect. Then you say Friday, sometimes wherever, you hear, oh, it's not right. Then you Friday, 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 right? So you have to repeat the process. So the way we learn foreign language, the way we learn singing, the learn way to do lots of things requires a feedback. And those experiments show you the outer cortex is part of our process. Now, one of the most important principles we talk about neuroscience is that how we, what we perceive depends on neuron the firing. So if you, when you speak, your outer cortex is modulated by your, your motor system. And then when you listen to your same word play from a year, it's not modulated. That's difference. That difference is why you hear your voice differently when it's played from tape recorder. Okay. If you go to Google, you ask why you type the question in Google, Google will tell you it's bone conducting. Everyone told me, but I want to tell you it's, it's more than bone conducting. Vocal production system, modulated audio system during speaking, that's why you hear yourself differently than hear from speaker. And this has a lot to do, not only speaking, but about music play. When you play music, you hear yourself, you just, it's, it's involved the same system, okay? And the, the textbook now doesn't write this now yet. In a few years, it, this will be written into the textbook because it's a crucial point of our auditory system allow us to speak and learn to new language, learn to sing and sing it properly, okay? Uh, I'm going to stop here in a couple of weeks to come back uh, to teach uh, the lectures of uh, the Smart Sensory System and, uh, and have a good uh, spring break. Earlier this week, um, 